without further ado, I'm going to in introduce John Siciliano. He's an above-the-knee amputee. He was in a car accident in 1993. He was in the 1996 Paralympics in Atlanta, um, competing in the 100 and the 200 meters. He's a former 200 meter record holder. Real quick story on how I met him. Last year, <laughs> we were doing a fundraising trip when we went to Mount Everest, Everest Base Camp and we raised money for the Challenge Athletes Foundation while we were doing this. And called Jennifer and the organization. We said, hey, there's got a lot of people that are doing this hike to Mount Baldy who, who have never met any challenged athletes. And I said, could you send someone? <laughs> so John, John ended up showing up and we met him and everything. I mean, Mount Baldy's 10,000 feet, right? John's a sprinter, I just told you. I mean, that was, he thought he was going for an hour long hike, not 10,000 feet, six plus hours or whatever. But you know what, he's a total trooper and I think he just really inspired the 20 plus people that were there. So anyways, put your hands together and welcome John Sicilia. Thank you, Tina. I'll never forgive you for that day, that seven hour hike. <laughs> Then, to top it off, so we get to the summit of Mount Baldy. Really, here's how they got me. We're on fire roads, and everyone's gonna break off. And I'm like, oh, these are fire roads, this is nothing. John, you look like you're strong. You, you probably come with this group, you know? The group, we'll meet them later. You know, her mom and the, you know, those, that types of, of hikers. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. And then it was, next thing you know, I'm like, switchback? What the heck is a switchback, right? So we get to the summit of Baldy, and then they pull out kazoos and balloons. And we're, now we're gonna, we're gonna train our lungs at 10,000 feet and see who can blow up a balloon the fastest. It was a good time, it was a good time. <laughs> it's a good, it's on the bucket list. Summit of Baldy, done it. Didn't even know I was going to do it. So, love, love, love these guys. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story, what happened to me, and kinda, I was introduced to the Challenge Athlete Foundation, and I got some soccer stories as well for, for my, my, my people here. This is great, this is great. <laughs> so my story is June 13th, 1993, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Steeler fans out there, anyone? Anyone? Yeah! Nice. <laughs> so, when you're an athlete, or just when you're born and raised in Pittsburgh, like you have a terrible towel in your crib. It's just the way it is. And, and so I was in college. I was kind of between my sophomore and junior. I was, I was a double major. Um, I was captain of my soccer team. I was on a soccer scholarship. So I was playing ball. Summer just started. I got my, my new job, lifeguarding at the wave pool. Yes, in Pittsburgh, we have wave pools. We don't have the beautiful ocean. We have a lot of rivers and a couple wave pools. So I was so psyched, you know, school's out and I don't care what age you're at, summertime, woohoo, it's the best time. So I got this great job, I'm playing this, uh, a summer soccer league, gonna audition for a play, cause I was also, I was like the jock drama club guy my whole life. So I did every play, I'm in school, I'm a double major, theater and journalism, doing journalism really just to keep dad happy because you, you know, who can make it in acting, right? So, and I was just playing sports. So that summer was great. I, uh, June, so we're like, you know, a couple weeks into it, loving it. At Tuesday night, my buddies uh, called me to go out and have some fun and I'm like, you know, okay, really, I don't have to work till late tomorrow and yeah, so it's so went out, nothing crazy. Um, at the end of the night, everyone's like, hey, do you want to go get some food? Siciliano, Italians, it's kind of against our religion not to go eat. So I was like, I'm down, let's go. So as soon as I left, the uh, little bar we were at, I yelled, shotgun, and I dropped, jumped in the passenger seat and cruising through the streets of Pittsburgh, beautiful summer night, no roof, no doors on this Jeep, music's cranked, woohoo, everything is great, right? Bam! Loudest crunch I've ever heard in my life. Just like that, I was on the ground. And I look up, and the guy that hit us was in a Jeep. So I just remember seeing these two demolished Jeeps. And the wheels were spinning, and there was a ticking noise, and it just got real surreal. And I'm like, oh my God, everything's gonna explode. I gotta get up and run. And when I got up to run, 
I noticed my leg. You know, it was still attached, but it was, it was really broken and kind of wide open and stuff. Uh, so I remember everything. I crawled about 20 feet on my elbows. I'm like, I got to get out of here before everything explodes. And uh, woo, woo, ambulance comes off to the, you know, the hospital. It's like a bad scene out of all those medical dramas, right? Where they always show the camera from the patient's face and all the doctors and nurses are hovered over you and they take you off to the OR. That was my angle, right? Fade to black. So I wake up two days later. Now they got me on a breathing machine, so they got a trach going down into my lungs, breathing for me, so I can't talk. They got me in a neck brace, so I can't look down, and they got me in hand restraints. So I can't look down, I can't talk, and I can't reach, and all I know is my leg was broken really bad. What was going on with my leg? So the nurse would put a pen in my hand so I could just write notes, and I just kept writing notes to her. I can't feel my leg. Is my leg okay? And she just kept saying, you're going to be okay. Don't worry, you're going to be okay. That wasn't my question. My leg, I can't feel my leg. Is my leg okay? And then I would just start feeling kind of claustrophobic and just couldn't, thing was choking me and I'd just start freaking out and whatever, another shot, whatever they give you, lights out. <laughs> so the third day I come to, I'm still in intensive care, but now I'm strong enough where they're breathing. I can breathe by myself. So they pulled the respirator out and I was just in complete happiness to have that thing not choking me. Um, and they kept me in the neck brace and the hand restraints, so I couldn't look down and I still couldn't reach. And I was just so happy. Well, here they come, right? Large Italian family comes in like, haven't slept in three days. Night of the Living Dead rolls up into my room and circles around me, and I'm like, dang, guys, like, it's like, what's going on here? You know, take a shower or something. People visiting me here, right? So no one's laughing, and I'm just trying to actually just like, you know, I know this is bad, but I had no idea until the doctor comes right over and is just like, we had to amputate your leg four inches above your right knee. Whoa, whoa, you. I was on a soccer scholarship. Sports was like, I played baseball, basketball, football. Just soccer was the one I was just like the best at, so I just loved it. You just, you amputated my leg. It means like, this is not gonna play soccer. I'm not gonna run. What? And I looked at my family and I just said, don't worry, I'll never give up. I just felt so bad that I just couldn't take the look on their faces. So I just hit the snooze <laughs> on what I had to deal with. And I was pretty good for about two weeks. Um, it got out, everyone in Pittsburgh found out about it. So it was small town Pittsburgh, it was on the news, in the papers, everyone was coming to see me. And, and I would always turn it on again, make everyone else feel comfortable when they'd come in and see John, you know, this athlete, all of a sudden about 120 pounds with the sheet, with the leg gone, coming in. So I try to make everyone feel comfortable. And I thought, don't worry, I'll be okay, I'll be okay. And it was 4th of July. And basically everyone went, it was the first time I had to be by myself and they made me inpatient rehab. And they all left. And I got in my wheelchair and I came back to my room and I literally got out of my chair and looked at myself in the mirror and lost it. Now, why this happened to me? Was I a bad person? Like, I'm never gonna play sports again. Sports, gone. I'm never, you know, dreams of being an actor, all the things I wanna do are gone. Why this happened to me? So, uh, next couple of days, it was interesting, a physical therapist came down, I'm in PT, and he comes and he gives me this brochure of these amputees running track. These Paralympic athletes running track on these prosthetic legs. And I take this brochure and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean you can run on, on, on a prosthetic leg? And, and, and what's the Paralympics? And whoa, whoa. And it gave me so much hope that I took it back to my bedside and I would look at that every day. Maybe that could be me someday. So, so I get through. Uh, you know, I get out of the hospital, you know, out of the rehab, and, and basically I'm on crutches for like two months till it's time to get my first prosthetic leg, right? I'm so excited, I am so sick of being on crutches. If you've been on crutches, you know what? Uh, the little things, like you said, go to the grocery store on crutches and try to push a cart. Carry a glass of water and a plate of food into your living room. Little stuff drives you crazy on crutches. 
and I just wanted to burn these things. I just wanted to get some normalcy back into my life. So I go to my prosthetics, I'm all excited to get my first leg, right? And woof! It, it's got pantyhose on it, right? <laughs> that doesn't look like the leg in the brochure. What? What is this thing? Sheer energy boy, my friends will rip me up in Pittsburgh wearing that thing. Come on. Welcome to the world of medical insurance. You see, at that time, I didn't have medical insurance. And for you little youngsters, don't even worry about this part of the story. For you guys out there, medical insurance is big, and that's what's, as I tie this back into the foundation here. So for me, I couldn't afford a running leg. And this is 1993. I had no idea the challenge finally, I don't even think the challenge finally was even in existence back then. So what I had to do was I had to get that brochure out. I had to call that company for like a month straight. And finally, the guy on the brochure returns my call. And I'm like, oh my God, please, I've never even seen a young amputee. Where are you? I'll, I'll go anywhere across this country to meet you, please. I've been staring at you on my wall since I lost my leg. Please, who are you? And he agrees he'd meet me in a month in Long Island, New York. And like Santa had nothing on this guy, right? I was counting down the days till I was gonna drive to Long Island and meet this guy. So I had to load up this car, drive all the way to Long Island, and that's when I met this above the amputee, just like me. And he ran 100 meters in front of me and lit me up. There he is. If you see it, there's no reason you can't do it, and there's no reason I couldn't run like that, if he can do it. Well, as a runner, you could have all the will you want. You need a leg to run on. And at that time, they were putting running clinics on, so I had to go to, all the way to Springfield, Massachusetts. And that's where they were putting on a running clinic, this manufacturer, and they saw my determination, and they said, look, the Paralympics are coming up. If you would, you wanna move to New York and work with our team, I'll, uh, I'll call in some favors and get you a leg you can run on. This guy was like just featured in Sports Illustrated. He was the prosthetist making all the fancy legs for the runners. So, uh, God bless you. <laughs> so, I ended up going up, so I'd go back to Pittsburgh, have a fundraiser, go to New York. Basically, this travel all around the world when all I want is just a leg to run on. But the good part of this story is when I went to my first track meet, I got down, you know, I was running a month and a half. I get down in the blocks and I look over and, right? Like there he is, like the guy in the brochure is like three lanes over, oh my God, he's gonna kill everybody, right? <laughs> Run his on your muck, get set, boom! He kills everybody, all he sees is catch back, <laughs> smokes at everyone. I have to run under a 17.5 to qualify for the Paralympic trials the following year. I ran a 17.44, boom, fourth place, just made it. But it gave me another year to run, and at that point, I had another year and a half of training, and so when I, my second track meet, the 1996 Paralympic Trials, when I got down in the blocks, I looked over. There he was. This time, wasn't so afraid of you, my friend. So, boom! I ended up taking him and breaking the 200 meter record that day, and, and it was pretty cool, it was pretty cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the coolest part of this story is I got to go to the 1996 Paralympic Games and I marched into Olympic Stadium with, side by side, with that guy on the brochure. <laughs> so that being said, my story, I come out here in 1997 to do grad school at USC for theater. And my buddy's like, hey man, you gotta go down and check out this Challenge Athlete Foundation race. This is 1997. Just moved out here, okay. What's this all about? Go down and wow, what I saw. I've missed one because I was doing a play in New York since 1997. And let me tell you what the foundation is about. Just from my story, like imagine if I could see that video. Or I'll tell you what, the foundation has sent me all across this country to meet people. There's resources out there. And I, luckily, I mean, I just refuse to quit, but a lot of people could just maybe get burned out of just keep chasing it and chasing it. And that's what I love about the foundation, is that 
if, if you become disabled, we have every resource possible. If you want to be an athlete, because I know for me, when I was running again, that gave me the confidence to do anything, to get back into theater school, to, to get my life back in track through sports. It was just so powerful how it gave me confidence to do whatever I wanted in life. And when I came out and I saw what this foundation does, I know I just want to be part of this. Whatever I can do, I will, you know, my motto, whatever, I'm, whatever you need, whatever you need, I'll go anywhere, I'll help anyone, because, and especially the amputees that I work with, my, my thing is with them is I'll help you, but in exchange, I ask for nothing except when it's your time, you teach someone how to run, and it's just kind of a pay it forward mentality. And this th these things aren't cheap, guys, you know, like, luckily, you know, I had to get it that way, but it's just awesome what they do, and, and, and generous people like Tina fundraising, because this stuff's expensive, and man, I'll tell you, you're changing people's lives when, when they start running again, or if they're in that chair, and all of a sudden they get a hand cycle, and they're out there doing 26 miles in a hand cycle. They don't feel disabled anymore. So. That being said, tying a little bit back to the soccer, as of March, the foundation, we went to Haiti. And I went to Haiti, and it was a quick trip, like leave Friday, come back Monday. And went down there Saturday, it was just full-fledged clinic. Um, you know, Haiti's crazy, 1.6 million people live in tents. It was eye-opening. And I tell you what, because it's so, it's, it's just, it's, it's just poverty down there. And their escape, is amputee crutch soccer. I'll tell you what, these guys will take six different trucks over to this soccer field where we put on this clinic, this dirty soccer field. And the thing is because not everyone can afford legs down there, but everyone, you put two forearm crutches and no leg, that's what they do. They're flying up and down on this soccer field with two forearm crutches and one leg. So that second day, I got up and they're gonna put on an exhibition. They have a team down there. They have two teams, and they scrimmage, and they play, and, and this is this their escape from everything that's bad going on. When they're on that pitch, it all goes away. And I was like, I never played crutch soccer, but I played soccer. I'll play. <laughs> and the great white hope was born. <laughs> there I was, out there. Woo, running with my arms. I remember I was like, I'm a pretty fit guy, but I run with my legs. You know, that's a whole different story running with your arms like that. And I ended up playing and the camaraderie, the sportsmanship, it was so amazing. And I forgot what it's like to play team sports again, track such an individual sport. It was so cool to be part of a team. And I didn't speak, I, don't, I couldn't speak their language. Yet when we were out there on that field, we didn't need to know. We knew how to play ball. And it was great. So it was an amazing experience for me. So a couple months ago, I get a call. Hey, we're bringing the Knights of Columbus. Uh, they're bringing, they're bringing uh, the Haitian MPT soccer team. We leave Saturday morning. I meet them in DC. We're gonna go to the DC United game. We're gonna do a halftime exhibition at the MLS game at DC United. We're gonna go to Walter Reed for three days with the soldiers. A lot of amputees there. We're gonna do an amputee uh, clinic with the soldiers. Then we're going up to New York. We're going to do a halftime exhibition at the New York Red Bull MLS game up there. We're going to do a bunch of school, high schools. And then we're going to go up to uh, Connecticut and do something with the governor up there. And then Friday we end it on like the Good Morning America show like that. And I'm going to be the captain of the team. Ah, soccer's back in my life. I'm really psyched. I'm really psyched. Um, so that's my story, guys. <laughs> Love soccer. I'm so glad to be playing again. You know, looking at all these little soccer players, such a great sport. Um, the foundation is amazing. I, I want to just say thank you for listening to my story, and I tell you what, your money will go to a good place. I, I promise you that, what they do. They do good stuff. So thanks for listening, everybody. About 10 or 11 years ago, I was sitting in my office, and, and I had this skinny little soccer player come in. It was sore foot, and uh, she was she was playing and trying to figure out what she wanted to do. And, and uh, 11 years later, I think she's figured it out. So I'd love to introduce one of my dear friends, Shannon Box. Hi, 
guys. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. Um, before we get started, I really wanted to thank um, CAF for coming today. Um, very inspiring. And, uh, you know, it gives hope and opportunity to so many people that have gone through some big obstacles. And uh, very cool to hear about. And I will be paying attention from now on. So thank you. Um, I also would like to thank Scar and Jim in particular. Uh, we've been friends forever, and he has helped me through a lot of injuries, and he's helped me conquer some, some big things, and I've been able to excel to the level that I am now uh, because of this guy over here. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, before I get into the message that you know we kind of are talking about today, about overcoming obstacles. Um, a little bit of background about me. Um, I grew up right here in Southern California, yeah. and I started playing uh, sports when I was around four years old. And I remember trying and playing everything. I played soccer, I played basketball, football, hockey, volleyball, anything, you know? I played everything I could. And it wasn't until high school that I kind of figured out the certain sports that I wanted to play. I lettered in four sports. I played volleyball, soccer, softball, and basketball. And I knew that soccer was the sport. You know, I wanted to go and play uh, at a university. I wanted to get a scholarship. And I remember my mom, who's in the back somewhere, she uh, told me, you know, there's not that many scholarships in soccer at this point. And I was like, really? And she's like, well, if you really want to get a scholarship, you might want to focus on softball. So I was like, OK, OK. Played club softball for one year. And then I realized, yep, I don't love it. I love soccer. So I'm going to go for that. Even though it was hard to get a scholarship, I decided I'm going to go for it. And I ended up at the University of Notre Dame on a full ride. And uh, helped my freshman year, I helped uh, my team to a national championship. And by my senior year, I was the captain of the team. And most importantly, I graduated with a double major in psychology and African-American studies. So worked out. Um, after college, you know, I thought my athletic career was done. And I had to start real life. I had to get a real job. And I was lucky enough that a new women's professional league started called the WSA. I played for the San Diego Spirit for two years. And I was considered the iron woman of the team. And then by the end of that second year, I was traded to the New York Power, which actually ended up being the best year of the three years that I'd played. And at the end of that time, I got lucky enough that I got asked to come into a national team camp and see if I could make it, which was a dream come true. Um, I had tried to make the team two years later, or two years before. I had tried to make the team, and I got cut. So this was my second chance, and I thought I was going to run with it. I was just going to try and do whatever I could. Um, it was right before the 2003 World Cup, and I remember the coach coming up to me and saying, you know, you don't really have a chance to make this team, but I want you to come out and train with the girls and see how you do. And maybe in 04, when the Olympics were here, you'll get a chance. So I had no fear. I went into that training camp and just enjoyed myself. And I had nothing to lose because I wasn't going to make the team anyways. So I went out, played the best I could because I had no fear. And in the end, she picked me for the team. I had never played for the national team before. Um, thank you. And in my first three games, I scored three goals, which a lot of people that know me know that I'm a defensive midfielder, and I don't really score goals. So that was actually really cool. Um, yeah, so, and then now, I've been on the team for nine years. I've played in three World Cups, which we just had one this last year, right, this last summer. And I've played in two Olympics, and we won gold twice. So I've had a very, very successful career. Um, and it's been amazing. I've enjoyed every part of it. Um, but today, we're talking about overcoming obstacles. And even though I've had a very successful career, it wasn't without dealing with challenges and overcoming different types of obstacles. My very first major one I'd say that I had to deal with was during the WSA. I played for the San Diego Spirit those first two years. And in the middle of the second season, we changed coaches. 
And up until that point, I'd been playing for, you know, I pretty much started. I played 90 minutes every game for the last year and a half. This new coach comes in, didn't like the way I played, and sat me for the rest of the year. I didn't play once. And I remember how hard that was. And I learned so much about myself because I had never been in that situation before. And I learned a lot. You know, I had to get through the year. I had to still show my team that I was cheering for them. I couldn't, you know, cry when I was there. I kind of waited till I got home and then cried my eyes out. Um, but, you know, it was a good lesson. And, um, you know, out of all the thoughts I remember, you know, going through that was, am I good enough? Why doesn't he like me? Why did the last coach like me? Why doesn't this coach like me? And to make matters worse, by the end of the year, that coach traded me to another team. So in my head, I lost complete confidence in my ability to play soccer. I didn't really want to play anymore. I wanted to quit. And for some reason, during that off season, I changed my attitude. I looked at the situation, you know, as a positive. And I said, you know what, I'm going to look at this and say, you know what, it's not that San Diego didn't want me anymore. It was that New York wanted me that bad. And so that's who went for me, New York. And so what I looked at was something that I was very weak at, which was fitness. Do you guys like to run fitness? Oh, no. Yeah. No. I didn't either. No. Nah. I didn't either. Not at all. And, you know, it showed. It showed in the end that that was one thing that I didn't work on very well. And it was one reason why I didn't make the national team the first time. So I said, okay, I'm going to work on my weakest thing, fitness. So I hired a friend of ours, and he trained me twice a week, and I trained the other four days. And I told him, I have two mottos. I'll never say no to anything you make me do, and I'll never quit. And by the end of that third season, I got asked him to the national team, and I made the team. So, and I made the World Cup team, which was awesome. So. Um, my biggest physical challenge that I've had to face are my in injuries that I went through. Um, my first major injury was when I was 28 years old. So I'd gone through most of my life without any major injuries and was pretty lucky. Um, but by the time I turned 28, uh, I went downhill. I had a lot of injuries all at once. <laughs> it was like, it just kept coming and coming. And, um, you know, I was playing on the national team in 2005 and I tore my meniscus in my left knee, and I needed surgery. And Dr. Rubin, who is back here, did an amazing job, and I love him, so thank you. And uh, got me back in two months. And uh, seven months later, I tore my labrum in my right hip, and I needed surgery. Yeah. Two months later, which is, took me two months to recover, my first day back at practice. My goalkeeper tackles me, and I tore my MCL and my ACL. Oh. <laughs> so it was a really hard year. And again, Dr. Rubin was there to help me get through some of these surgeries. And of course, um, you know, I have the best physical therapy ever in SCAR and in gym who pushed me the whole way. Throughout the whole process, I remember fearing that I would never be good enough again. I feared I'd lose my spot on the national team, but in the end, you know, I made sure my focus was all about getting better, stronger, mentally, and physically. And Jim and his staff was a big, big part of that. So I appreciate that so much. And I remember seven months later, when I was back on the national team, um, I remember going in my first slide tackle and getting up and be like, wow, that worked. It works. <laughs> and I knew I was better than OK. I was going to be stronger. And I have been. I've been mentally and physically stronger ever since then. And I know that working out and is helping that. So that was very good. Um, an obstacle I've been quietly facing for the better part of nine years. And this is kind of the biggest obstacle I think I've had to face my whole life, um, is my battle with an autoimmune disease called Sjogren's and lupus. Pretty much my immune system cannot tell the difference between good and bad tissue. And so it attacks and destroys healthy tissue, which can cause inflammation, pain, and damage to various parts of my body. I struggle with extreme fatigue and joint pain and various other symptoms. 
In recent years, there have been days that I can't even work out. There are days that my joints hurt so bad I can't touch them. But through it all, um, you know, I've been able to continue playing. And besides my team and those closest to me, I haven't really spoken about this in public because I never wanted to use it as an excuse. But we are here today because we're talking about overcoming obstacles, so I felt like it was a good spot to say this. Um, you know, I know it's something that will be with me for the rest of my life, but in terms of my soccer career, I've decided that it's not gonna beat me. And there are definitely days that I go out and try to train and I can't do it. And it makes me so mad because I feel like I've failed. But I wake up the next day and I realize it's not gonna beat me and I try again. Um, during the World Cup, this last one, my coach knew about it and we had to play five games in a short amount of time. And she told me that she, would want it, she wanted me to start, she wanted me to play as much as I could, but that if she could, she would take me out every game so that I would get a little bit of rest so that I could make it through the whole tournament. Um, in the end, <laughs> my competitiveness gets the better of me and I played in four full games, two of them overtimes with PKs in a short span of time. So I proved to myself, I think, and I proved to others that this illness will not be an excuse. I know, um, many of you guys probably don't know how old I am, but I'm 34 years old. Um, it's nearing the end of my career, which is old, I'm sure, to you guys, right? Um, I'm ending the, you know, I probably have one or two more good years to play at the level that I'm playing at. And, you know, my most recent obstacle right now is beating all these young players that are coming into the national team who are very good players, right? I'm older, I'm getting slower. Well, I was pretty slow at the beginning, right? But I'm getting slower and I have to work harder to keep up with these young players. And I know you guys may say, oh, but you've been starting forever. You've been on the team forever. But you know what? Every time that I've been on this team, every practice, Every game, I'm out there to prove myself because you are never entitled to a spot, especially on the national team. You're never entitled, and I think you guys need to remember that, that you have to prove yourself every single day. You know, and you can have days that you just don't want to be out there, but then the next day you got to come back and push. You know, and that's something that I think is very, very important for you guys to learn. Um, but when all is said and done, and I decide to retire from soccer, I know that the experiences that I've had and going through the obstacles that I've gone through are only gonna help me in my real life. And I don't fear the challenges that are coming ahead um, because I know I've done it. I know I've gone through them. So, um, you know, and I think for you guys out in front here, don't take anything for granted. You know, you look at John and one day he's great and the next he has life changes. And I think just enjoy, you know, the fact that there are some people that can't get out there and go run. They can't go out and play soccer. So enjoy it every single day. Enjoy what you're doing. And uh, you know, if you run across an obstacle, make sure that you believe in yourself, you ask for help if you need it, and you realize that you are stronger mentally and physically than you ever think you are. Thank you.